How many of you know what a rave is? <laughs> it's a musical concert, right? With lights and flashing sounds and all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, it's an, and it's an event and all. Uh, the challenge is that there's a lot of ecstasy there. Yeah, and I'm talking about the drugs, okay? And, and there are numerous people who, who uh, oh my goodness, well, they, uh, there's a lot going on there that probably you all wouldn't want to know, or, or at least you all shouldn't be doing, <laughs> okay? However, Rob and Colleen go to raves. And they regularly are invited to go inside the rave, oftentimes without even having to pay for the tickets. This weekend, Colleen is in Texas with uh, Plurway Austin, a brand new branch of Plurway, which is their ministry that they do at raves. And they go to these raves and, and they, they simply go there. And in fact, they are known. They got to Florida recently for a rave and, the, and, and people came up to them and said, you're the rave moms, aren't you? And these are, and, and what it is, the moms go in, dads don't go in because you see, girls are fairly skimpily dressed and sometimes with almost nothing on top and stuff like that. And, and you know, guys, we're kind of visually oriented. And so it's probably not good for us to be in there. But, we're, but the dads, the rave dads are outside cooking food, praying, and rescuing people. And, and what's, what's interesting is I was, I was reading this last night and as I was coming home because I get their prayer requests from on Facebook and they're, they're regularly doing updates. And there was this young man who came to them and was staggering by and they tried to stop him. And, and one of the things is when you're on ecstasy, you, you, um, well, you, you dry out, you dehydrate. And so you need lots more water. So one of the reasons that your mouth does certain things, so you have to have like a pacifier, and they'll actually literally have pacifiers in there so they don't bite their tongues. And I mean, there's a lot of things that we think ecstasy is wonderful because it's supposed to be this sexual excitement thing. And, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of problems with drugs. Let's just face it. Way more than any of us admit. And folks, some of you think that a rave is meaningless and has no harm. I'm sorry, that's not true. And, and, and I'm going to tell you that there are people that are dying, young people that are dying at raves, and unfortunately, it's kept out of the news. There was a young man named Nathan last night that, that um, and so I was starting to say, he came by and, and uh, he, he was staggering, and so the, the, the moms tried to help him, and so they got him some water, and um, then they said, you know, why don't we take you over to the tent, and they took him to the tent. There's a tent that's supposed to be there for first aid. They got him to the tent and all, and eventually he was uh, taken to the hospital. We don't know what happened to Nathan at this point. Um, there was uh, several other young people that were quickly rushed out of there who were literally dying. And um, the rave moms, Simply love on these kids. More than once, they get barfed on. Literally, more than once the same night, okay, by different kids. They get barfed on. Um, they're, they're, they're dealing with all kinds of just stuff. And it's not real pretty. But what's, what's so moving is to listen to Colleen talk about, I love these kids. I love these kids. And, and she'll sign off. I just, I love these kids. And, and what she has found is that she and, and new moms that they're training across the country uh, are finding that this is an opportunity to go in and love kids. Now, folks, it's dirty, it's messy, you're up all night. And most of them don't make it to worship on Sunday morning because they were out there till like three, four, some of them, sometimes they're out there all night long. They spend their own money. The dads are out making pancakes or hot dogs or something else like that to, to give the kids food. Um, and they're praying. And what they're doing is simply loving kids. Loving kids. What they've learned is, is that what God's called us all to do, to love one another. It's the ministry God's given to us is to love one another. That old, old song was, they'll know we are Christians by our what? Love. By our love. 
They'll know that there's something different about us by our love. It's one of the reasons why they won't know it by our gossip. They won't know it by our dissent. They won't know it by the conflict that we have with one another. They won't know it by our meanness, by our attitudes of selfishness and self-centeredness. They won't know it by that, will they? Unfortunately, that's sometimes what they think of us. The world looks at Christians and thinks we are judgmental, critical, harsh, unkind, unloving. Now what's interesting is, Jesus was hard on sin. But tough on love. And so the people flocked to him. He's hard on sin. He, he doesn't play it down. What he plays down is the judgmentalism that's simply going to try to punish and put people into ritual that's going to put them in a form of, how do you want to say it, prison, rather than set them free to live and know that they're loved. And what is he, Jesus saying? Did you, did you see it in the little video clip there? We're in a, let's read from Mark chapter 2. Because Jesus is going to speak to a man who's been brought sick. He's paralyzed. He's unable to walk. And we don't know why. Frankly, this is kind of a goofy story when you think about it. Now, why couldn't they have just waited for Jesus to come out later? Why do they have to go in and break a hole in the ceiling, a hole in the roof, to drop him down? In fact, our, our, the, the video here gives a unique kind of way of seeing it, right? He's dropped down inside and you see all the dirt falling. I think that's because even the, even the guys who made this movie, Son of God, were like, how do we deal with cutting a hole in the roof and dropping this guy down with all the people down there? Because Mark, you're going to see it in a moment. Mark says that Jesus was speaking inside the house to the people and that they tear the roof open and drop him down right over Jesus. I guess it didn't matter because they didn't shower as much then. But think about this, okay? Somebody's starting tearing the roof right here, okay? You got rafters going across this way because that's why the lights are in like this, okay? So you got rafters going across here, and there's probably about a big enough space that if we could cut a hole through there and drop somebody down, what would you and I both do if somebody did that right here during worship? Well, I'm preaching up here. Good thing I move around, huh? <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> so, so now you, you have to understand that the place was so crowded that they couldn't get him in. There's all kinds of people in the way. And so they, 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 they got this guy. They're carrying him somehow. And, and scripture actually tells us four of them. That, so they're carrying him and they're bringing him to Jesus. And they can't get him there because the place is packed. Wouldn't we, that'd be interesting to have that problem. You have people so interested in Jesus that this place was packed. And they were outside and looking in. And, 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 you can't, and because of that, you can't get in here with somebody you want to get to Jesus. And so you got to climb up on the roof and you got to break a hole in order to get in. Now, I'm like, you know, guys, be a little patient. I mean, did, did this guy just get paralyzed? I mean, I don't know, and maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe that's some of the issue here. Maybe this is a recent thing. We'll go back to that in a minute, it's okay? Remember it. If you don't remember it and I don't remember it, we'll talk about it later. Let's look at Mark chapter 2. Let's see what the Word says. A few days later, after the man was healed with leprosy, right? All right, so some cool things have been going on. Jesus has already left Capernaum. He's been out walking, going more in the wilderness because his fame is growing and the crowds are surrounding him. And so he's moving to other towns. And so he's been out preaching and all. But a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. I remember that phrase too. So many gathered there, there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins 
are forgiven. It would have been interesting to have ended the story right there. Son, your sins are forgiven. I wonder what that man was going through when, when he said that to him. Is he paralyzed because of something stupid that this guy did? Like run into a tree, riding 40 miles an hour on a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> for our guests Pastor Bill did that <laughs> broke his back and his cracked ribs and all kinds of stuff because you know, you, you know hey it's fun to ride a bike fast in the mountains right oh, yeah. yep especially downhill <laughs> it's the uphill that's the painful way normally <laughs> so, so here let's go on son your sins are forgiven now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves. The movie has the guy talking out loud, right? But scripture says they're sitting there thinking to themselves. Interesting. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. As this text begins, Mark says that Jesus came home. Now, some of you who are scholars remember that Jesus was from Nazareth, and he preached at Nazareth, and, it, and he talked about the fact that in Nazareth that, that he was not accepted there because that was his hometown, right? Right? Uh, my hometown is Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but I grew up in Upland, California, and I now live in Crestline. Where's my home? I don't know. That's my problem. <laughs> so we've been 24 years in Arizona, right? Well, where's home? I'll tell you where home is. Home's where Debbie is, <laughs> and she makes it home. Okay, but, but look at this. Jesus has been to Nazareth. He's left Nazareth, and he realizes, I'm not going to be listened to here in Nazareth. So what's he going to do? He makes himself a new home. Did, did he buy a house? Doubt it. <laughs> Does he have a place that's his own? No way. <laughs> in fact, where do we think he's staying? Simon Peter's mother-in-law's home. That's where they had dinner a few weeks earlier. After he had been at the synagogue, after he had cast the demon out of the man, he goes to what? Simon Peter's mother-in-law's home. We're just going to call her mom, okay? He's at mom's house, and he stays at mom's house. And when he gets there that first day, he heals mom of a bad fever. And mom's so healed that she jumps up and starts cooking a meal. She's energized because God's blessed her. Well, the news of that gets around, and sunset comes, and now the Sabbath is over, and so all kinds of crowds come, and finally Jesus says, i got to get out of here, and he goes out and prays alone by himself. The disciples come and say, hey, they're still back at the house. They want you, and he says, good. We're going on to the next town because my job was to preach, and he says, I'm going to preach, and I'm going to cast out demons, and that's what he does. Well, he's come back home. He's back at Capernaum. Ask Leslie about that, okay? Because he's back at the sound. And incidentally, Capernaum's about 20 miles away from Nazareth. And here, he's now come to Capernaum. And for most of Jesus' ministry, he's going to spend his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful, oh my goodness, beautiful area of Israel. And so he's there, and, and he's come back to Capernaum. He's come home. Incidentally, the word that we may want to take note of here is he's back at his oikos. His oikos, his household, his community, where he's got connections. Who are his friends? Uh, Simon Peter, James and John. Andrew, Bartholomew. Oh, these are the guys that are there with him. Several of them are fishermen, aren't they? Who are based where? In the fishing town of 
Capernaum. So he's come home. He's come back to people that he cares about, that are special to him. He's come to get a break probably. And he gets to the house and what happens? The crowd comes again. This is one of the reasons why he's staying away from the town. He's worn out by all the people. But he's, he's coming in there. The disciples are excited that he's there. The town's excited that he's there. And so they gather in the place and they, start, they come to hear him talk. And so it fills up. I mean, it's packed out. And because of that, there's some guys who also come. But before I go to those guys, I need to ask you a, a tough question. Are we in the way of people getting to Jesus? There were so many people in the house that these men could not bring their friend to Jesus. A man who, by, by Jesus' own description, needs forgiveness and healing. This is a needy man. But the place is so packed out with all the people who are just interested, just, you know, like, you know, happy followers, you know. Are they really committed? Don't know. Probably not. But they're there. It's the day to be at the house. Place is packed out. They found the parking place out front. Going to use that spot. They have their seat. You better not be sitting in it. <laughs> are, 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 seriously, think about this. Are we in the way of people getting to Jesus? How do people come to Jesus? Well, the Spirit works in their life, right? Ah, but Jesus has a plan, and we are the plan. The Spirit works in us, and we invite them. Or better still, we love them. We love them like what I was sharing earlier about Colleen and Rob and the, mom, the rave moms and dads. We love them to come to know Jesus. In fact, last night, one of the young ladies accepted Christ right there in the parking lot. Others continue to seek and search and, and, they're, and they're like, wow, you know, okay, thank you for loving us. We want to get to know this Jesus better. I mean, God's working through them. Well, God wants to work through us. But are we in the way of people coming to Jesus? And here's one of the ways we're in the way. We're in the way when we don't invite. Let's face it. We have been given a commission. That commission is to go into all the world. And when we don't go and invite people literally into our homes and into our lives, into our oikos, our household, when we're unwilling to do that, we're in the way of people coming to Jesus. When we think that church is just about us and we need to come here because we got to get fed, we got to get encouraged, we got to get built up, and it's, and it's for us, and it should be, right? I mean, shouldn't you come here and get encouraged? Somebody say amen. <laughs> shouldn't you come here and get spiritually fed? Yes, you should. But, but if that's all you're doing is just coming for what you want, for what you're going to get, you're in the way of people coming to Jesus. You said, oh, Bill, you're kind of like, what are you saying? We shouldn't be here? Maybe not if you're in the way. Because do you need it if you're in the way? If other people don't know Jesus. Folks, are there people in this community who are dying and don't know Christ? Do you know them? Do you know the names of people around you? Do you know their hurts and their heartaches? Well, let's look at these guys again. So there's these guys, and it's interesting, if you look closely at Mark's text, he says that there are several people that are bringing their friend to Jesus, and four of them are carrying his mat. Well, that's kind of helpful. It's better that it's four than just three, because, you know, which, who's going to carry what part of the body, right? So four people makes the job a lot easier. Each one on a corner. But notice, there's more than four, aren't there? Do you see it? 
There's more than four that are concerned about this man. Now, this makes me start asking some questions. Who was this guy? You realize people that are born lame, unable to walk, probably are out on the street and not cared about. There's simply a beggar out there, and people simply walk by them, occasionally toss them something, but they basically ignore them. They don't know their name, kind of like Lazarus who was sitting outside the rich man's house. We don't know the rich man's name because Jesus doesn't give us his name, but Jesus gives us the name of Lazarus because Lazarus matters to Jesus. Well, that uh, a lame man like this normally wouldn't matter unless maybe something happened to this man more recently. This is a man who's been a friend to others. This is a man who's been known by others. This is a man that other men care about because they have this relationship with him and they're concerned about him and they hear that Jesus is in town and that Jesus heals, they say, let's take him to Jesus. They are so concerned about this, friend. And you have to kind of wonder, you know, what's this guy thinking as he's laying on the mat? You're taking me where? Guys, I don't want to go. Guys, not again. Guys, don't take me to a crowd. Nothing magical. Guys, please don't do that. Or, or is he saying, oh, thank you. I've heard about him too. Thank you, guys. Thank you for caring about me so much that you're willing to take me to Jesus. We don't know any of that. All that is kind of all conjecture for us, isn't it? All we know is, is that four men are on corners of the mat and some other men are with them and they're bringing this man who cannot walk to Jesus. And these gentlemen are pretty special men, aren't they? In fact, Jesus describes them this way. Jesus says, Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith. And so he says to the man, I forgive you. He saw their faith. He saw it. How did he see their faith? Because he saw the dirt coming down. He saw the hole opening up. He saw the man being dropped down in front of him. And he realized that these are guys that are willing to go to any cost, to any, any, any task, to any difficulty, to any barrier to bring their friend to Jesus. These guys got faith. He can see it. How? Well, you can see it from their action. James says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? And he goes on then in verse 26, and he says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Jesus says, I saw their faith. Uh, I saw in their actions, belief, confidence in God, a faith that moves them to say, we're gonna take action, we're gonna carry him to Jesus, and they do. These are friends, folks, these are friends who really care. These are friends who are willing to go out of their way to be uncomfortable, to do something that's difficult. Why? Because they believe that Jesus can help their friend. These are, these are men that are determined. <laughs> They're not going to let a crowd get in the way. They're not going to let the fact that there's no room for them stop them from getting this man to Jesus. And so they stop and they have a committee meeting. Well, something like that must have happened because... Or one of them, you know, is just really dominant. I don't know how it happened, but they have this conversation probably, and okay, we can't get in. It's packed out. Look at all these people. Okay, take him home. Too bad, dude. No, no, that's not that way at all, is it? <clears throat> they care so much about him, they say, they come up with a way. Okay, look. <laughs> no one's up on the roof. Yeah. So let's take him up there. <laughs> and how's Jesus going to get there? Let's break through the roof <laughs> and put him down. You're crazy, man, but I think it might work. <laughs> it's, so, so they work it out, they dig it through, and, and it wasn't that hard, okay? I, I, I mean, there was a barrier there, but it wasn't as hard as you think because, you see, they're like usually about boards, like logs like this that went across, and then laying the opposite way, if you think of, think of these logs laying like this, well, laying the opposite way were branches, and you'd lay a lot of branches there, and then you'd put mud on top of that. 
Mud. There's no rebar, folks. <laughs> okay. There's no nails going on to, into this. It's just a bunch of mud and, and leaves and stuff like that. And it all piles up there and it gets hard. And now you can stand on it or break a hole through it. And that's what the guys do. They care so much about this man. Their faith is so evident. They believe that their friend is more valuable than a building. I'm going to let that one sink in for a minute. They believe that their friend is more valuable than a building. Is church a building? No. Or is church a group of people who understand that they are called to care about their friends? To invite their friends into their oikos, into their house. To connect personally, intimately with them so that they know their hurts so well they identify them in detail and exactly what's necessary. Got to carry this guy to Jesus. And buildings don't matter. Nice rooms don't matter. Even if my house is a little cabin with one bedroom and it's in the living room, I can invite people into my home. Because buildings should not stand in the way of relationships. That's what these guys understand. And Jesus says, I saw their faith. I saw their faith. Did Jesus see your faith? Can he see in your actions with the people around you, your oikos, your community of people who are your friends, neighbors, relatives, can he see in you your faith in him? Or are you just religious? <clears throat> or worse yet, selfish? I don't know if the guys got down there. It almost sounds like they don't. It sounds like they're up above on the roof and they've lowered their friend down and and what's taking place? Well, Jesus reaches out to him and says, your sins are forgiven. And you kind of have to wonder what the guys would have been thinking up on the roof. What's he doing? Oh, he's touching him. Cool, okay, we're getting close. Now what's he doing? He said, your, what? He said, your sins are forgiven. His sins are forgiven. What? What's he doing that for? Tell him to heal him down there. You have to wonder, what, what were these guys thinking as they're watching this take place? And then there's this silent conversation. <laughs> you all have them during worship, right? <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many conversations do we have going on right now? <laughs> how much dialogue do we have going on here? And we have some kind of, you know, like, no way, Bill. Huh? You know, quit talking to us, say we're selfish or something like that. Or, you know, no, what, what's this about healing? And I mean, there's all kinds of conversations going on right now, right? And, the, and there's a few going on in my head, too, so we're in real trouble here. <laughs> so, so Jesus is saying, you know, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'll try to come back to this one, okay? <laughs> Your sins are forgiven. And, the, and there's these religious guys. And, and folks, don't be mean to these guys, okay? These guys have been taught to honor the word of God. And notice the truth that they are speaking. Hey, wait a second. He just said, your sins are forgiven. Nobody can forgive someone else's sins except God himself. Now, you have to understand what he's saying here when Jesus says this and, and what the scribes understand also from the word of God. He, they're not talking about, okay, if I do something bad to Paul and I come to him back to him, and Paul, I for, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And Paul says, I forgive you. Is he being God? No, no he's just being Paul. Okay. And in that moment, can he forgive me if I've done something wrong to him? I hope so. <laughs> so yes, he can forgive me. So that's not God, right? Okay, but I do something wrong to David. 
And I go over here and I say, Paul, could you forgive me? I sinned against David. I hurt him. I beat him up. I blew him out of the wall here. Okay. Could you please forgive me? Oh, well, he can say he forgives me. It's kind of easy for him to say it, right? <laughs> but I did it against David. So David's the one who's got to forgive me, right? So now when sin, and this is what the scribes understand, sin against others is sin against God, and only God can forgive that. It's not something about between you and another person you've harmed. It's your stuff, your garbage. Only God can forgive our garbage. Only God can do that. And that's what they're starting, they understand. They're sitting here, wait a second, did you hear what he just said? He just said, I forgive. And they're saying it inside. I love that. They're not saying it out loud. And Jesus, yeah, he's got the kind of a, an innate ability, right? I mean, he probably knew. I mean, it's kind of easy for this one, I'm sorry. But, you know, scribes are sitting over there. They know the law. They better be saying something like this. Only God can do that. In fact, Scripture tells us this. Nehemiah 9, 17, they refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. It's in God's nature to be forgiving, Psalm 103, 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed their sins, their transgressions from us. It's Isaiah 38, 17. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. Thank you, God. It's Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Thank you, God. Only God can forgive sin. And so Jesus says, you're right. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I want you to know that the Son of Man, and who's the Son of Man? That's the phrase that Mark's going to use regularly when referring to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I want you to know that I have authority to forgive sins. And so to prove to you that I have authority to forgive sins. Son, get up and walk and go home. And the man does what? He gets up and takes off. And the guys are trying to catch up because the friends are still up on the roof. <laughs> he gets up and he walks to show that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. Oh my. Oh my. What's amazing about this is this is before Jesus has died. Isn't that incredible? This is before he's put his life on a cross, before he's become sin for us, taking all the nasty yucko on himself. This is before that he has authority to forgive sin. You see, you have to understand that this is somewhat what was the Old Testament view of forgiveness, however. It's a covering. Look at how Isaiah said, he puts the sin back here. It's as far as the east is from the west. He's moved it away, but God's still in the middle there. But with Jesus, what happens? Sin is what? Washed away. Washed away. I don't know about you, but I'm sure thankful for that. That Jesus Christ will forgive my sin. I got stuff I don't want you to know. 
But Jesus has forgiven me. Jesus says, I want you to know I have the authority to forgive sin. I, I died. See, we're on the other side now, right? <laughs> I died for your sins. And I don't want you to live in them anymore. I don't want you to live in the shame anymore. I don't want you to live in the embarrassment anymore. I don't want you to live in the guilt anymore. And I don't want you to live in it anymore. I want you to be set free to stop. I want you to be a brand new person. I want to give you new life because I, Jesus Christ, have authority to forgive your sins. Do you want it? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to do for your oikos? For the people who are around you, friends, relatives, neighbors, co-workers, people you spend time with on some kind of regular basis. That's your oikos. God's put you there to be a missionary on their behalf. God's put you there to share the love of Christ with them. Whether they accept it or not, you're still there to love them to Jesus and give them that opportunity to know him. And it comes because you love and really care, are sincere in your concern for them. What are you willing to do for them? Are you willing to let Jesus forgive your sin and cleanse you from it? And are you willing to carry them to Jesus? Are you willing to share that with others so that others get concerned about them as much as you're concerned about them and they help you carry them to Jesus? Are you willing to get out of your comfort zone and interrupt a crowd and a very special meeting and cut the hole in the roof and drop them in the face of Jesus? What are you willing to do for the people in your oikos, in your community who don't know Christ? Or are you one of those who's in the way? Lord, help us. If we're in the way of people coming to Jesus. God, every single one of us has needed to lie on that mat. Some of us need to lie on that mat right now, today, Jesus. And we need to lie there and ask and accept your forgiveness. We need to let you turn us into new people. We need to allow you to pay the price for our sin. We need to accept it and start living different because you've forgiven us and made us new people. And so some of us just got to lie down and let you heal us. Some of us have stuff we're going through, pains and sorrows and heartaches and difficulties, God, and we, just, we need you to pick us up. We need your love. And some of us, God, need to confess that we've been in the way. We've been in the way of neighbors and friends and family coming to know you because we just haven't taken the time. We haven't cared enough about them. We've been busy doing church for ourselves and not invited them to know you. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to be a people that loves like you loved, and help us to believe that you are the Son of Man, the Messiah who forgives sin. In Jesus' name.